Silent cinema, an era that started in Poland in 1918 and lasted until the end of the following decade. Sound in movies was not introduced in Poland until a few years later than elsewhere, which will be discussed in our next lecture. On the one hand, we might consider it a lucky coincidence. This allowed for the development of a Polish, if not industry, then at least a decent filmmaking craft. Differences between regions that had been divided between the three neighboring powers were gradually reduced. In what used to be ruled by Prussia or Germany, the film industry was second to none. They had the best cinemas too. It was there that the UFA major film studio was established in 1917. But, as I said, this quickly evened out across the country, with Warsaw coming to the front, not only as the national capital, but also the capital of the film industry. It was during this age of silent cinema that certain characteristics became apparent that would determine the nature of film production in Poland for years to come. First, there was an excellent awareness of film, combined with a constant dissatisfaction regarding domestic production. If years later, in modern-day Poland, we still experience this conflict between artists, filmmakers who think they are underappreciated by Polish critics, that's something that began back in the 1920s. There was a number of authors who wrote about film, to mention only intellectual, writer Karol Izykowski, Stefania Zachorska, or Antony Słonimski, who became an active film critic in the 1920s. They were brilliant, intelligent, and loved cinema, because, after all, this was the golden age of cinema. There was a number of exceptional film artists, burlesque, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, as well as shadows of such phenomena in arthouse cinema as German Impressionism, or the excellent quality of French cinema, or American melodramas, Victor Sjostrom's The Wind, etc. All these were released in Poland fairly quickly, with a delay of no more than a few months. Masterpieces of Soviet cinema were the exception. They were regarded as propaganda films and banned by the censors. Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin and Pudovkin's Mother were possibly the only major works of world cinema of the 1920s that were never released in Poland. But then Pudovkin's Storm over Asia was in fact released in Poland, as were most subsequent Soviet films. The Skamanda poets, for instance, were in love with German expressionism. The cabinet of Dr. Caligari, Bernau's The Last Laugh, Robert Wiener's The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, etc. They loved these films. They would write poems about them. And later, when they would go to a domestic film, they'd end up disappointed and become critical. In 1994, Karol Izykowski published a book called The Tenth Muse, a theoretical treatise on the cinematograph. It is said that if Izykowski had published in one of the major European languages, German or French, not English, because at the time that was a second-rate language, but had he written in German or French, he would have had a truly international career. A brilliant book. It contains several chapters on Polish cinema, in which Izykowski, while being fond of Polish cinema and believing that a critic writing about domestic films should take responsibility for it in a way, point out its weaknesses, he isn't overly critical of these films. 
I remember this expression in which Polish directors are too by the book, no straying, no enriching the story. They're literal, telling the story while paying little attention to social details. Then there was Stefania Zachorska, who, by the end of the decade, was considered to be Poland's most prominent film critic, accused Polish films of being parochial. She wrote an excellent piece called Film in Naftalin. In which she states that compared to American films, which were acquisitive, or German films, which were psychologically sublime, or French, funny, or Russian, involved. Polish films tended to tell simplified love stories or simplified martyr stories. There was a lot of truth to that. It might be difficult to be truly objective in assessing the quality of production in the 1920s because there are relatively few surviving films from that period less than one-fifth of feature theatrical releases. Every now and then, a new print will be found and restored. Then Filmoteca will screen it. One such recent find was the almost whole print of the 1928 film Pantadeusz. Or Rock 1863, Year 1863, an adaptation of Jeromsky's novel The Faithful River. These films were once considered missing or mostly missing. What do these resurfacing prints prove? I doubt that it would change our assessment of these works if we were able to see them in their entirety. These films were in fact second-rate compared to the major works of the 1920s. This is best visible in the field of comedy which hardly existed in Poland. Possibly because the great American comedy works of the period were made by brilliant comics, each of whom had his own original form of expression, often based on physicality, Chaplin, Keaton, Harold Lloyd, etc., Laurel and Hardy. They were all about physicality, being at odds with the world. Polish cinema did not have this type of a comic personality. It wasn't until sound was introduced in film that the comedy genre grew in Poland, being more based on dialogue, on verbal comedy, written by acclaimed Polish satirists writing for particular actors. But that doesn't happen until the 1930s. For the moment, in the age of silent cinema, there are three sort of cultural blocks, to follow Stefan Żółkowski's terminology, who applied it to Polish culture of the 1920s as a whole. But it's equally useful when considering production of feature films, because the documentary genre hardly existed and newsreels wouldn't appear until the end of the decade. First, there was the culture of politics and politically infused films. Their importance was naturally tied to the historical context, the newly restored Polish state, rightfully fearful for its independence in those early days, just getting settled in its new borders. It was quite early, perhaps not early enough, but rather early nonetheless, that the propaganda potential of cinema became apparent. Cinema was suddenly seen as an area that might help with the political cause. 
And the first truly important Polish films addressed politics and the historical context. In those early days, they were actually produced by government organizations. At first, the central film office of the Polish army. Later, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, which supervised the film industry throughout the 1920s and 1930s. These two institutions also produced films, films such as Dla Ciebie Polsko, For You Poland, a film directed by Antoni Bednarczyk that premiered in June 1920. This was an example of patriotic cinema that addressed the question of the Polish-Soviet war. The film ends with Piłsudski's triumphant return from Russia to Warsaw. Immediately following his appointment as field marshal. The film's two protagonists pray at Ostra Brama, Gate of Dawn in Vilnius. The female lead, played by Jadwiga Doliva, dresses up as a soldier and goes to war. The enemy, the Russians, are portrayed here as a wild horde and a threat to Polish society. In her book, Niesamowita Słowianszczyzna, Maria Janion superbly described the causes of such treatment of Russians. On the one hand, historically justifiable. On the other, a result of a long-term inferiority complex which the Poles overcompensated by feeling superior to Russians. This stereotype of Poland's cultural superiority as a member of Rome-based Christianity versus barbaric Russia, this stereotype was best visible in political cinema. The first national blockbuster in Polish cinema, Cud nad Wisłą, Miracle at the Vistula, also touched on the Polish-Soviet war. This film premiered in March 1921, and it is an interesting example of the strength of the film industry, which was able to produce such an extraordinary feature work in such a short time, after the Bolshevik War. Cud nad Wisłą, or the Miracle on the Vistula River, is the popular term for the Polish-Soviet War, especially the Battle of Warsaw, which took place in August 1920 and was won by the Polish side, mostly as a stroke of luck. A few months later, a film that centered on this particular event also premiered. The Battle of Warsaw was its focal point. This was a joint effort of the Polish film industry. The screenwriters had ties to the military. The army delegated officers who could write to become screenwriters. This was also the only feature film made in Poland by Richard Bolesławski, acclaimed stage director. A Polish nobleman educated in theater in Russia. A student of Stanislavski, whom he imitated. His real name was Ryszard Shrednicki, but like his mentor, he took on a pseudonym that derived from the Polish name Bolesław. During the First World War, he felt the call of the land. He returned to Poland and made a few films. But he did not feel comfortable in Warsaw. He quickly left and moved to the United States to become a truly brilliant director. Stage director at first, the creator of the American Laboratory Theatre. 
and later moving into film directing as well, making a series of excellent films featuring Greta Garbo, Marlena Dietrich in the 1930s, before dying a premature death. But before that, he made Tsudnad Viswan, Miracle at the Vistula. He was considered to be a director who was excellent at handling crowds. The battle scenes were well directed, but that wasn't the key issue. This film portrays Poland as a sort of paradise, a blissful place on earth, freshly independent. The first sequences in this film, the beginning, are set on Christmas Eve. This celebration is simultaneously shown at a manor house, among nobility and among peasants. In the same place and simultaneously, the two are connected, because the peasant's daughter is having a, I wouldn't say affair, because she's happily in love and her love is reciprocated. She's in a relationship with the young nobleman. The role of Krista, the peasant daughter, is played by Adwiga Smosarska, the second star of Polish cinema after Pola Negri. Very different from Negri, an archetypical young Polish maiden. She was extremely popular throughout the interwar period, especially in the 20s. The young nobleman is played by Jerzy Leszczynski, heir to the acclaimed Rapatsky and Leszczynski family. All three of them play in this film. They play the family. So, in a way, it's a real family. The acting family is one with the film characters. Vincente Rapatsky plays the grandfather. Blissful coexistence of the various social strata. Smosarska's character, Krista, leads a lifestyle typical not of a peasant girl, but that of a well-groomed young woman. She sculpts. Her Christmas gift for her sweetheart is a hand-embroidered tapestry. And this blissful life is suddenly threatened by the savages from the east. So, victory in this battle, in the Polish-Soviet war, serves as a restoration of order. In the finale, the order being restored in the political world coincides with order being restored in their private lives. Two couples are joined together at the same time. This double wedding marks the happy end of Tsudnad Viswą, Miracle at the Vistula. In the second half of the period, the role of political cinema was taken over, which will be typical of Polish cinema for years to come, by adaptations of national literature. Another enterprising producer appears, competing with Sphinx, Jewish-born Alfred Silberlast, who takes on the name Niemirski. He produces a few major motion pictures based on national literature. He convinces acclaimed stage director Richard Ordinski to become a film director. First, there was Mogiła Nieznanego Żołnierza, The Unknown Soldier's Tomb, in 1927, based on a novel by Andrzej Struk. Following the success of that film, he made Pan Tadeusz, in 1928, the biggest Polish production of the silent era, made to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Polish independence, a signature piece of Polish cinema. 
Let's stop for a moment at Pan Tadeusz. On the one hand, it certainly was a major local accomplishment, intracultural. Even a critic as harsh, often spiteful even, as Antoni Słonimski admits that he was moved. He even praised the performance of Mariusz Maszynski as the Count though today we don't see it as a particularly outstanding performance. Perhaps it was because the audience needed this type of national accord that Pan Tadeusz, one of the greatest pieces of Polish writing, was bound to be well received. But in terms of filmmaking, it wasn't a great accomplishment. This film seems a bit dated. It's a series of tableaux vivants, which on the one hand are nice to watch. Polish audiences enjoy seeing a live Zosia, Telimena, Tadeusz or The Judge. But if we remember that this is 1928, the age of such great films as Siostrom's The Wind, or Friedrich Wilhelm Murnau's excellent Forst two years earlier, we'll realize that in terms of film art, these were not exceptional works. It's a pity that there are no existing prints of Przedwiośnie, The Spring to Come, a film made also in 1928 by Henryk Szaro. The reviews for this film allow us to believe it conveyed a lot more of the work's original artistic value. But we can only rely on the reviews now. The second type of film culture of the time, or filmmaking, is more playful, more closely tied to film art. That playful type of culture, genre films. Within the various genres, filmmakers attempted to develop their skills and make use of actors to create certain types. An example of this is Poland's first crime mystery, Czerwony Błazen, Red Jester, produced in 1926. But there were no major accomplishments. Of the films that still exist today, the most interesting appears to be the 1929 picture Mocny Człowiek, Strong Man. Still a silent movie, also made by Henryk Szaro, who made this film after Przedwiośnie, The Spring to Come. His career began as a stage director in Russia. He had worked with the great Zivolod Meyerhold as his assistant on the stage production of Mocny Człowiek, Strongman. An adaptation of Stanisław Przybyszewski's novel, who, as we know, was not held in high regard by literary critics in Poland, but was highly acclaimed in Russia. His novels, such as Mocny Człowiek, Strongman, were often turned into stage plays. And this film adaptation, made in Poland by Henryk Szaro, was an attempt at a major international production. It was lensed by the fantastic Italian cinematographer Vitrotti. The title role of Bielecki, who tried to implement Nietzsche's theory of Übermensch, was played by Gregory Chmara, a Russian-born excellent non-professional actor with a fantastic appearance. A strong lover type. He was perfect for this part. It was a film about metamorphosis, about one man's moral transformation. From an evil man who caused the death of a friend and went on to steal, himself lacking talent, he stole his friend's manuscript and passed it off as his own.
But gradually, for the love of the woman of his life, he began to change. He decided to repent for his crimes and, in the finale, admitted plagiarism, committing suicide on stage. This was very well staged, and it remains one of the few Polish films of that silent era that has a second life today. Perhaps not in wide circulation, but certainly in film academic thought. It has also been released on DVD, with a new soundtrack by Maciej Melanczuk's band. It's one of the rare examples of Polish silent cinema that has a new life in its small circle of followers. And within this same ludic type of films, one must mention the so-called Sphinx Golden Series. This was the last decade of activity by Poland's top producer of the early period, Aleksander Hertz, who died in the late 1920s. By the 1930s, Sphinx was no longer producing films. But back in the silent era, the company had its golden age, and the Golden Series was about releasing one major hit per year, similar to the American major film studios, one that would make money and allow for the production of several smaller films to try out new or backup actors. The Sphinx Golden Series movies always starred Jadwiga Smosarska as the female lead. She was often described as being the personification of the Polish spirit, so the audience simply wanted to watch her. There were several major hits in this era. One of the most interesting films was the 1925 picture Ivonka, based on Juliusz German's hit novel, which had two editions in 1925 alone, and several more editions in later years. This writer is now forgotten, it hasn't been on the market in years. But I must admit, I went to the Jagiellonian library to read it, because the film no longer exists. So, to have an understanding of the plot, it must be read. And it is certainly an easy read. One simply can't put it down. A story of a sweet teenage girl who has major life adventures, seduced and kidnapped by an evil spy, a Soviet spy, of course, played by Józef Węgrzyn, and happily in love with a Polish army officer. That is the basic premise of the film. A similar premise, related to Polish patriotism and martyrology, was predominant in other Sphinx productions. It's a pity that most of these films are now gone. Judging by the reviews, another interesting film was the 1927 adaptation of Ziemia Obiecana, Land of Promise. Unusually credited to Hertz himself as director, along with Zbigniew Gniazdowski. That was meant to take advantage of Władysław Raymond having recently been awarded the Nobel Prize. The film no longer exists, so it cannot be compared to the famous picture by Andrzej Wajda made half a century later, but judging from the photographs and the reviews, it is not a film that might lose in this comparison. What's interesting, it was made as a contemporary piece. The story was set in the 1920s. Finally, the third cultural model of the period that was mirrored in cinema was the autotelic model, filmmaking that had artistic ambitions. It might be slightly exaggerated, but there were a few auteur personalities in Polish cinema at that age. 
The first among these, at least chronologically, was Viktor Bilgański, who trained as an actor and went on to make films throughout the 1920s. Films that would, by later definitions, be called auteur films, based on his own scripts, and that was their weakness, because he certainly wasn't the greatest literary author. Or perhaps my view is slightly biased, because I later had the great pleasure of speaking with his wife, Carlotta Bologna, who said that, as far as she remembered, he would read sports news exclusively. But if, aside from psychology, he showed any kind of awareness in his films, it was certainly a good knowledge of cinema itself. He had been a cinephile, or at least a film enthusiast, who was familiar with German and French cinema. Such discoveries of the avant-garde in terms of editing in the films of Abel Gans or Deluxe Photogenie. That was more the domain of Tristan, but he certainly tried to introduce new solutions in film editing. According to the reviews, again, because none of these films exist today, Orle, The Little Eagle, Zazdrosht, Jealousy, Otchwan Pokuty, The Abyss of Repentance, Kobieta, która grzechu pragnie, The Woman Who Desires Sin, the titles of his films show the scope of his subject matter. And apparently watching these films, having a taste for their production was more of a pleasure than the storytelling itself. Unlike the narrative, which wasn't the greatest, the strongest side of his films was the cinematography. He worked with excellent cinematographers and acting. He placed great emphasis on film acting that was rid of the theatrical manner. He even opened an acting school, the Film Institute, as it was called, where his assistants were future top Polish film directors of the early sound era. Leonard Buczkowski and Michał Waszynski. He educated such actors as Maria Bogda, Adam Brodzisz, Nora Ney, or Carlotta Bologna, who went on to become his wife. After making Kobieta, która grzechu pragnie, the woman who desires sin, Bigański lost heart for filmmaking, and in the 1930s, he focused exclusively on acting or directing educational films. Another auteur, particularly revered by the members of the much later Start group, who considered him an exception in their otherwise despised world of Polish film, was Juliusz Garda. His brilliant debut film was Kropka nad I, Dot Over the Eye, a film about making films. The plot is set on a film set. Authors with avant-garde ambitions come together and attempt to think of a story, trying out various plot lines with the acting couple whom they selected to play the male and female leads. The film unfortunately no longer exists, but seems interesting, judging by the synopsis. Julius Gardan later caved to the rules of the film industry, producing what should be produced. Trendovata, The Leper, Vrzos, The Heather. These were melodramas. But his 1930s films were unique in their distinct filmmaking culture. Even though he may not have met the expectations that followed his extraordinary debut, Kropka nad i, Dot Over the Eye. He was, in fact, a well-educated man. His real surname was Gradstein. He was from a family of artists and musicologists. He even started writing a PhD thesis on Proust at the University of Warsaw. But he abandoned his studies once he got pulled into the film business. 
Leon Tristan, number three in this group, his real name was Wagman. He also came from a Polonized Jewish family. His brother was acclaimed poet Adam Wajek, also Wagman. Tristan was the first representative of a new avant-garde filmmaking culture. He was a fan of Deluc, trying to introduce Deluc's photogenie theory into his work. He made a medium-length film called Kohanka Shamotte, Shamotte's Lover. An amazing film, based on the fantastic story by Stefan Grabinski about a man who would make plans with his loved one, spend the night with her, only to learn that he's living with a corpse, that she was really dead. He was played by Igo Sim, who will later play a particularly evil role in Polish cinema. Leon Tristan's later works in the 1930s did not live up to the expectations that followed his debut, although he did make one of Poland's most beautiful comedies, Pietro Wyżej, Neighbours. Then there was Józef Leites, intellectual, philosopher and chemist, graduate of the Jagiellonian University, with very distinct auteur ambitions. By the 1930s, he would prove to be the best among Polish directors in terms of professionalism. But at the end of the 1920s, still in the silent era, he made his film debut, Huragan, Hurricane, a story about the Polish uprising of January 1863. Using iconography from the works of Artur Grotger. The film was co produced with Austria and had an international cast. Luckily, a print of this film exists, so it's still possible to see it today.